Oxygen Blast technical seminars are an Intertech production. For instructor-led.net, Java, and XML courses, visit us at www.intertech.com. What other philosophies does Spring espouse to? Well, they believe that good and simple design should not be compromised by the underlying implementation technology. Many of you probably started off your software careers, especially if you were learning object-oriented development, with something known as object-oriented analysis and design, OOAND. Probably learned things like UML and how to build applications using essentially uh, philosophies from some of the engineering community about how to first design and then build our applications. But in reality, it becomes pretty difficult, especially in enterprise technology, for using good object-oriented analysis and design capabilities. Why? Because they're tough to really keep up with what the actual application is as the application is being put together. In other words, the models that we see in object-oriented analysis and design often don't reflect the ultimate end code because the end code, the enterprise technology, usually has to be too intertwined with something like EJBs or other frameworks to really facilitate good parallel connection to the original design models. Spring says that's nuts. We should really be able to use those good technologies, those good techniques we learn in good analysis and design independent of any kind of implementation and be able to use those throughout the life cycle of our applications. What are some of the other uh, philosophies that Spring espouses to? Good applications should be easy to test. Now most of us are probably familiar with uh, unit test frameworks like JUnit. However, how many of them can you use today, especially in those enterprise environments? It's tough to unit test applications that are running in things like Tomcat or WebSphere or WebLogic. We usually have to have a lot of apparatus up and running before we can even get one line of code executed. That makes it somewhat prohibitive to environments like JUnit. So testing enterprise applications, especially when they're comprised of very tightly coupled components like EJBs, is often difficult or sometimes impossible. Yes, there are some test frameworks that work in these environments, but they're not altogether easily transported from one environment to the other. So Spring says, again, this is nuts. No, one, no way to run a railroad. We need to provide an enterprise environment, a framework development environment, that supports good unit testing. Coding by interfaces is also something that Spring espouses to. Now this is a rule as good developers we should do regardless of our framework. But typically, we don't always think about building an interface first and then building a class to implement that interface. Well, Spring kind of espouses and actually, I don't want to say enforces, but highly encourages to think interface before we think about code implementation, or if you will, class implementation. Interfaces provide for a much more loosely coupled and pluggable type of solution. And Spring really does, through its API, help to encourage that type of interface first, class implementation second type of philosophy. Spring says we don't want to compete also with good existing solutions that might be there today or there tomorrow. For example, Spring provides an MVC web development environment. However, they say if you like struts, if you like tapestry, if you like JSF, we'll integrate to those environments just as well. And there might be technologies in the future that you like better in certain areas of the application environment that we should be able to integrate with. Spring believes use what you are familiar and like about other environments and we'll try to provide the fill-in, if you will, the gaps around the rest of the application development. And lastly, one of the uh, philosophies that Spring espouses to is that checked exceptions usually serve little or no purpose. This is something even James Gosling has questioned in recent years about whether or not checked exceptions maybe have been a little bit too highly, de uh, maybe too highly used, or uh, maybe another way to say that is too prominent in our Java language. So a lot of times we'll find that in checked exception try catch boxes, we'll find little to no reaction to those exceptions that occur because in many cases the application can't do much about it. Think about things like SQL exception, for example. It's usually very difficult to recover from some sort of SQL exception error, such as the database being down or maybe the uh, SQL string being provided is incorrect. So what Spring says, when a checked exception really can't be recovered from and serves very little purpose, why detect it and why even capture it? 
So a lot of what Spring espouses to works on runtime exceptions. And we'll talk more about that in class as well. So the bottom line is Spring provides a framework that many say promotes applications from a development perspective that are easier and less complex to develop, easier to test and therefore of better quality, and much more flexible and therefore easier to maintain. We hope you see those principles and the results of those principles come out in class over the next few days. Now applications built on top of the Spring Framework are largely comprised of simple Java objects. Again, POJOs, plain old Java objects. These objects are generally configured with XML, although more recently, especially with more recent editions of the Spring Framework, they may be configured by things like annotations. Now in addition to the API and the framework that Spring provides, the framework is actually more than just that API, more than just the general constructs of building application. It also provides what's known as a container. If you will, the Spring container is what actually manages the lifecycle and the configuration of our application objects, which are those Spring POJOs, Spring Java objects, which we call Spring Beans. So in fact, your Spring Beans or POJOs live inside of the Spring container, and of course that Spring container is running inside of a JVM or other type of container, such as an application server, WebSphere, WebLogic, or Web container like Tomcat. So indeed, what we have now are components running inside of the Spring container, and then the Spring container running inside of potentially other containers, or at the very least, running inside of the Java JVM. So the Spring environment, the Spring framework, provides this set of API, set of principles and constructs around how to build enterprise or maybe non-enterprise applications, as well as environment to actually run those applications, and that being the Spring container. As I mentioned, the term bean here that we use, Spring bean, was not chosen by accident. The term Spring Bean, again, is a takeoff on the idea of Enterprise Java Bean. Mr. Johnson and Company felt they wanted a less complex framework and therefore a less complex type of EJB component to build our enterprise applications with. So at its core, Spring Framework is basically based on two key technologies. And we're going to learn two, these two throughout class, one being dependency injection and the other being aspect-oriented programming. Both help to serve in promoting loose coupling and building applications that are, again, easier to build, easier to test, and of better quality, and more flexible. The first concept, dependency injection, otherwise known as DI, is how object, objects or beans, again using the spring vernacular, are brought together by the container to accomplish some sort of task. When we think about application code, we're often talking about many components, many objects working together to get some work done. Well, the same thing happens in a Spring application. But dependency injection, also known as inversion of control, or ILC, is a means by which we give the Spring container to help us assemble those objects to get work done. An example is in order here to help simplify this idea. Let's say, for example, we were building some sort of application where we had a customer service object. And like most service objects, it must get data in and out of a database. And so we also devised some sort of, let's call it customer data access object or customer DAL to get data in and out of the database. Now in many application worlds, what we need to do is somehow get our customer service, its customer DAO, through some sort of lookup, something like JNDI, or maybe even just do it manually. In other words, we give customer service a DAO property and then say that DAO property equals new customer DAO. Well, that's how we do things in the world today. But in dependency injected worlds, whoops, excuse me, in dependency injected worlds, we're going to find that we never ever create new objects in our code. We allow the container to give things like the customer service object its customer DAO. Now, how is that done? Well, not a lot of tricks here. It has to be done through configuration, again, either done by XML or annotation. And we'll talk more about that principle in much more detail later on in class. For more free learning resources and to see the latest lineup of our instructor-led.net, Java, and XML courses, visit us at www.intertech.com.